Hello, hello, hello. You ask why I, ask, I say it three times? Well, just because I can. Karibuni here in Kenya and happy to see you all. Thank you for making time to spend an hour with Wawero and I and of course our guests this evening. Today's talk is about international relations, the what we call the game of chess. Um, it would be interesting to know how this game of chess is played in the local and international arena. And to learn more, we'll hear it from the experts tonight. And with us, we have Dr. Anita Kiamba, Dr. Peter Mwencha, and Dr. Kigen Murumbasi. Note, I did not say MD after each name. So I'm sure you can put the two and two together. And our host, the man himself, Mr. Waweru Njoroge, and Elijah the Invisible, and thanks for watching us. For those watching us live on YouTube or Facebook, you can ask questions or make comments and we'll bring them up on screen. Uh, we value your contribution and your questions. You can follow us uh, via our Twitter and Facebook handles at Great Leadership Live, the eight being uh, number eight, or email us at greatleadership at gmail.com. So, Aweru, Habariako. Missouri Sana, how are you doing? Not bad. Very busy for a Monday morning. It just started with a bang. Ow! Yeah. But the sun is out. Okay. The week, I'm sure, will continue in the same vein, I'm sure. I pray. Okay. So looking forward, looking forward. I want to... Yes, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting panel. Uh, three doctors. Uh, I'm feeling a bit intimidated because I don't have a uh, PhD or anything after my name, but we'll see how we can make the most, most of it. Welcome to Great Leadership Live. Uh, today we're obviously talking about international relations, and I'd like to say a very big thank you to our panel of guests. Um, I'm going to ask them each to please introduce themselves very briefly, tell us what they do and what how they're involved in international relations, and then we'll kick off the show. And of course, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, I'm burning issues that you'd like to find out, please do send your questions in and we'll get our panelists to answer that for you. So we're going to start with the ladies first. Dr. Kamba, please introduce yourself uh, and how you're related to international relations. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Anita Kamba, a senior lecturer at the Institute of Diplomacy and International Studies at the University of Nairobi. I've interacted with international relations for a long period of time. It was my area of study. It is currently still my area of study. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamba. Dr. Mwancha, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Uh, thank you, Aweru. Uh, my name is Dr. Peter Mwencha. I am the secretary and the CEO of uh, International Relations Society of Kenya, uh, but I'm also a lecturer and a researcher um, in the field of trade and uh, development. So I also have an undergraduate um, degree uh, in international relations from uh, USIU. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Mwencha. And last but not least, Dr. Morumbati. Please uh, let us know who you are. Thank you, Oweru. Uh, my name is Dr. Kigen Morumbati. I'm a lecturer in international relations and security at Strathmore University. Um, and my interaction in IR has been in my studies, my undergraduate, master's, and PhD. And I, my research interests are also in the same. So I eat, sleep, drink international relations. That's what I do uh, for a lifetime. So thank you all for having me here. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our guests again. Uh, let's kick it off. Uh, this is going to be a question. I'm going to open the floor to, um, to all of you. I'm going to obviously start with Dr. Kamba first again, but here's what I want to point out. Uh, in the words of Carl Dish, international relations is the area of human action where inescapable interdependence meets with an inadequate control. Trevor Taylor defines international relations as a discipline that tries to explain political activities across state boundaries. Simon Brown postulates that international relations is the investigating and study of pattern actions and reactions among sovereign states as represented by their governing entities. How would each of you tackle the question of the meaning of international relations? I'll start with Dr. Kemba. All right. Um, international relations basically is the culmination of the set of relations between states and non-state actors, because, you know, we often forget that there are non-state actors also operating in the international system. Um, so we look at them. We also look at the interaction between those particular actors in the international system and the outcome 
of the relations in the international system. So basically, it's um, looking at those actors, we identify them, we look at them, and we also look at the interaction, the set of interactions between the actors in international relations. Uh, Dr. Rambasi, uh, same question to you, sir. You're muted. Uh, I've unmuted oh, you. Yes, thank you. I'll just, I'll just follow up with what Dr. Kiamba said. Uh, as we're looking at the interaction between state and non-state actors, now we're trying to also look deeper into it where we are seeing when we're looking at state actors, we have national interests. Uh, so each state has its own national interest. So in international relations, we're trying to see how states pursue their national interest in the international arena. And therefore, we have different foreign policies of states. And now, as we have different foreign policies of states, another thing comes in. We have competing interests among the actors in the international system, be they state actors or non-state actors. So we are also looking at how these competing interests are uh, pursued by the different actors in the international system, which brings us to diplomacy. You know, diplomacy is about pursuing competing interests in a way that doesn't rub the shoulders with the other actors as well. So international relations is basically looking at those through using various tools and various levels of analysis. Thank you, Dr. Murumbasi. And Dr. Moencha? Uh, thank you, Awiru. I think uh, uh, the, my two colleagues have basically extensively um, de uh, described international relations in detail. But uh, if I can chime in, is the international relations for me again is uh, the set of uh, relationships, um, engagements, and uh, interests that countries have, and how they then um, uh, how countries go about. Uh, uh, sort of like pursuing their interests, as Dr. Keegan has mentioned, but also now with um, uh, the um, evolution of the international or other uh, um, international relations, we now have the emergence of um, non-state actors such as uh, multinational corporations, um, in, uh, international organizations such as the UN. And uh, in Africa, we have uh, at a regional level, we have or continental level, we have the African Union. So these new uh, actors that have also come into being now also intermediate this relationship. And therefore, this becomes a very complex um, array of relationships. And that's what makes international relations so, so interesting and so broad. So, and we also have personalities. So these are individuals who also play a role, um, as you've had diplomats now, and what they do uh, in terms of the decisions they make when they're pursuing the... Um, interest of their country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Much. Actually, I'm going to pick up on the aspect of uh, actors a bit later on. Uh, there's some questions I want to ask you about that. Uh, but for now, I want to look at the aspect of um, how international relations actually affect Kenyans as a whole. You know, uh, We have a, a, a global aspect where we are getting smaller and smaller through communication technology, rapid air transportation, um, and also complex international economies. Uh, so the value of peaceful and cooperative relationships between nations is very increasingly evident. Dr. Moencha, I'd like to start with you, then I'll move back to Dr. Morumbasi and finish with Dr. Kemba. What is the importance of international relations, especially in the context of how they affect the common monarchy? Uh, well, thank you. Um, two things that um, I should have mentioned when I was giving my definition. If you look at, uh, if you try to organize these relationships that we've mentioned amongst actors, you can look at them from um, at, at at level. So you can have a look. You can look at them at um, multilateral level. You can look at them at um, bilateral level. So um, if you're looking at it, let's say at a bilateral level, which is the relationship between two countries. So for a for a Kenyan for a normal Kenyan monarchy, if you have uh, been following what's happening in the news uh, with regards to the um, differences between Kenya and Tanzania, um, many are wondering why this is happening uh, and why we keep having this uh, constant shift with the, between the two countries. Um, and and that's where international relations come in. So when you when when a country um, is pursuing its national interest, you are pursuing your interest. 
which might be uh, not necessarily uh, aligned with the interest of another country. Or once in a while, uh, conflicts do happen or disagreements. And that's where the uh, international relations come in. So diplomats, who are the ones now who are tasked with advancing the interests of countries, are the ones who now smooth over these things. So if you see what's happening uh, between Kenya and Tanzania, and, and I'm, I'm trying to put this into context, then you can say that there's a breakdown in, um, there's a diplomatic um, uh, crisis between the two countries. And this is not something that can just be handled by anyone. And that's why we have uh, diplomats and an embassy in Tanzania. And those are the first uh, points of, uh, you know, in engagement with the other countries. But then when you look at, uh, in, uh, for, uh, from a multilateral level, look at organizations such as the UN and the World Trade Organization, and even the African Union at a regional level, why do we have these organizations? Obviously, when you have, when you have uh, just, it, just by looking at the example that I've given between Kenya and Tanzania, you start to see how complex it becomes when all countries join in or when you now have a, a range of actors that you're dealing with. So therefore, um, uh, for, for, for a normal person, they may not be able to appreciate what happens uh, in the background when countries are trying to, uh, say, come at a, uh, arrive at a common um, approach to handling issues such as COVID. You can see um, the challenges that have been brought about by COVID-19. If, uh, if let's say you want to travel, uh, like I said, between Kenya and Tanzania or from Kenya to, say, the U.S., and you have to go through another country, how does this happen? There's a framework that organizes whether it's transport, whether it's trade, whether it's security, and, and so on and so forth. And therefore, uh, international relations now is the, provides the framework and the, act, and the, and the, and the uh, channels through which this kind of engagement between states and non-state actors can happen. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Mancha. Um, I'm going to move on in terms of, I know how much time we have. That's why I know this trying to look at the time. So what I'm going to ask, and if our guests want to try and what we've asked before, um, they can. What I want to ask right now is um, the aspect of the theories of international relationships, right? So the theory of international relations is a set of ideas mm. that explains how the international system works. Unlike an ideology, a theory of international relations is, um, at least in principle, backed up by concrete evidence. So, Dr. Kemba, let me ask you the question, what are the two major theories of international relations? And then I'll come to Dr. Mwencha, uh, Dr. Murambasi with the question, what are the fundamental concepts of international relations? So, Dr. Kemba, the theories, and Dr. Murambasi, the fundamental concepts. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we've got two main theories uh, that have been there since 1914, since the study of IR began, after the end of the First World War. And um, these two theories were basically to address the causes of war. And um, the first theory basically is liberalism, that um, everyone got to begin thinking about and um, how we can engage in a liberal world that has got institutions that can prevent any war from occurring ever again. And now we also have international institutions for that. So moving on maybe to the current or contemporary IR, liberalism is still evident when it comes to um, issues of institutionalism in the international system, the role of human rights in, in the international system and the protection of those rights. And um, basically we talk about li liberalism in terms of expansion, in terms of um, trade relations and how nations can become liberal in that nature. The second main theory is realism. And uh, realism basically, just like it suggests, it's about the real world and goes ahead to suggest that, um, you know, it's not what the world ought to be, but what the world is in the international system. Whereas, of course, liberalism is what ought to be. And therefore it was, it has been said to be utopian kind of, because not everyone wants to, you know, be in a certain position. So realism basically is the one that talks about where we are currently and the role of states and how states always want to pursue their interests. Never mind, there are also other states that are pursuing their interests. There's often a clash. However, um, as we continue, you know, thinking about those two theories, there's one that comes in between to let us know that you cannot have heavy emphasis on one of the theories, and this is complex interdependency. And with that, we bring in aspects of realism, 
and aspects of liberalism because it is a complex world. There are complex relations between nations around the world and therefore, um, without going too much because we do not want to be too abstract, we've got liberalism and realism. But at, a time, at times, nations are able to use both um, because we are situated in a complex international system. Uh, thanks, Dr. Kim. Is there an aspect of idealism as well? Yes, idealism is liberalism. They are both the same, okay. and um, it's more or less utopianism. Right. It's the same okay, theory, thanks, yes. Dr. Okay, Dr. Morumbasi, so what are the fundamental concepts uh, in international relations? Uh, thank you, Uwero, uh, for that good question. Now, when we're looking at the fundamental concepts, uh, you know, these are bringing down from the theory that we have just seen being discussed. Uh, among the most important concepts discussed in international relations is that of sovereignty. You know, everyone talks about the state is sovereign actor in the international system. Uh, any country you talk about, they talk about being sovereign. So really, what does it mean to be sovereign? And what, that, what implication is that? So sovereignty just basically means where states have the mandate and have the powers to formulate and enforce uh, domestic law without external interference. So this is a situation where the government of any state is actually the supreme. It's not answerable to any other government, which actually brings us to the second concept now. If we're saying each state is sovereign and each government is the supreme body, then we're saying that uh, now at the international level, then the international system is anarchic. Uh, I know many of us, when we talk about anarchy, uh, it would point towards uh, a situation of chaos and all that, but uh, it's far from it. When we're looking at it from an international relations uh, perspective, we're saying that there is basically no government above the state. So it's a derivative of this sovereignty that we're talking about. Uh, so all states, you know, sometimes they, like the realists would see it as a self-help system and the liberals would say, because we don't have a government, we can come up with international organizations so that we can interact peacefully amongst each other. So this brings about uh, other, just I'll mention other three uh, key ways in which states now interact using these two principles. When we have uh, sovereignty, which brings about anarchy, which uh, all states are predominantly equal, there's no other government above. Uh, so states now interact in three ways, using either dominance, where we see the dominance principle coming in, use of force, sometimes there's war, sanctions, ETC. Then sometimes there's cooperation, as the liberals talk about, where now states cooperate, it's more reciprocal, like pre-trade areas, ETC. And uh, other times now states form identities, such as the African Union, African states coming together in order to pursue uh, interest that might be common since we don't have really a government about the state. So that's just an overview of the basic uh, principles that we have in IR. Thank you so much, Dr. Morimbasi. Um, I'm going to put a pin in that AU because I'm going to come back to AU. Uh, there's something I need to ask about that. Uh, in the meantime, let me just <clears throat> look at the aspect of international law. So international law is a collection of rules and regulations that have evolved over the past few centuries. These rules define the rights and obligations of states. The International Court of Justice in the Netherlands is the judicial body of the United Nations and is responsible for resolving disputes among states. Dr. Mancha, this is my question to you. How effective is international law um, and what is the importance of treaties? And on top of that, how many different kind of treaties typically exist? Not the entire spectrum, but the ones that are more important in terms of those treaties. Uh, thank you, Aweru. Uh, uh, cities form the uh, basis of most uh, modern international law. If you look at, uh, uh, say, uh, international agreements, as we call them, um, which I'd also refer to as treaties, the, 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 the framework of uh, coming up with a treaty is based on consent and uh, negotiation. So, if you want to say, if, you, if you're asking question regarding the effectiveness of international law, then it all depends on how um, uh, willing countries are to uh, subscribe to a certain treaties or to sign on certain treaties. Because as Dr. Keegan has mentioned, uh, states are sovereign. And if you look at the, uh, from the concept of sovereign, uh, sovereignty, states can act 
um, in whatever way they want uh, because of their uh, because of the uh, of their national interest and because of sovereignty. And this is where now the issue of consent and negotiations come in. If if a state, uh, if you want to come up in the international treaty, then it means that you have to go through a certain process of negotiations, and that's where now uh, certain forums, international forums, serve as the venue or the platform for where this sort of negotiations uh, happen. So, for instance, um, when we were coming up with the um, treaty on the international criminal court. This is something uh, for Kenya, this is something that we uh, willingly signed on. It's not something that we were forced or we were, um, you know, coerced into. Because countries have, uh, you know, they have the freedom to act in whatever way they want. So uh, international law then becomes very complex because you find that uh, certain countries have um, are parties to certain treaties or certain um, they've signed on to certain uh, laws or uh, international agreements, whereas others have not. So then it becomes it becomes very complicated um, to sort of like navigate uh, through these different uh, legal uh, frameworks or, or treaties. So for instance, uh, uh, you are asking uh, which are some of the um, treaties. There are treaties to do with, uh, say, international transport, um, IATA, International Air Transport uh, Association um, uh, Agreement. So, if you look at how the um, countries or international trans uh, international travel is um, regulated, this is based on a treaty that countries have signed um, uh, onto. So, um, if if say you want to travel from one country to another, these protocols or these um, frameworks that you know regulate how that transport or travel between one country to another is going to happen. If you, so, so the example that I just gave again, like ICC, if you want to prosecute certain crimes, which they at, at cannot be pro, uh, prosecuted at country level, that's where we have now the International Criminal Court. And as you can see in our case in Kenya, that was a very contentious um, issue. And Kenya actually um, put out and, and, and it, it was even, pushing other African countries or we were um, um, influencing other countries to pull out of the ICC. So this these issues of uh, international law, for me, I can say it's only as effective as the countries or as the, um, um, the, the nation states want it to be, because the nation states are the main actors when it comes to the um, uh, international law and uh, treaties. Thank you. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to Dr. Morumbasi. Um, Something that Dr. Manchia mentioned at the beginning when he was uh, answering the first question. So the aspect of um, international it's international agreements uh, that create um, international organizations, which are institutions that set rules for nations and provide venues of diplomacy. Uh, Dr. Morimasu, what roles do international government organizations and international non-governmental organizations play in the, uh, in the IR ecosystem? Ah, excellent. Thank you, Aweru, for that question. Uh, so we're seeing, uh, probably as Dr. Mwench has mentioned, that you know these things are formed by treaties. So I'll go back to some of the concepts I talked about to highlight some of the functions of you know international IGOs and international non-governmental organizations. Uh, so you see, uh, like when you see the world went through world wars, for example, uh, one of the questions came that how can we ensure that we can mitigate the negative impact of anarchy where you know states are sovereign they can act the way they would uh, therefore states came up with a framework to try and come up with this uh, reciprocal way of doing things so one of the ways is you create an international organization uh, of which now governments are parties to it uh, such as the united nations uh, african union uh, and even at the sub-regional level, you can look at ESC. So here, uh, what states are predominantly trying to do and the function that these uh, intergovernmental organizations try to do is try to coordinate the different uh, approaches of the different states to come up with a common approach towards uh, the common problems that states face. Uh, so for example, uh, the recently signed Africa Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement the common good there was to facilitate intra-African trade. So with the absence of a 
global government to facilitate that. States come together, sign a treaty, and say, let's come up with this organization uh, where we can coordinate all our interests, uh, we can bring our interests together and pull our resources towards uh, searching for uh, the common interests we have. So that's how we see now international organizations coming in and being important uh, aspects of uh, international relations. And there are different roles of international uh, intergovernmental organizations. Sometimes if you look at, for example, during the Cold War, uh, there was a common interest by some states for collective security. So they come up with NATO, a military alliance. So in a nutshell, uh, we have those dealing with trade. And now at the international level, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, is here. Uh, it started at one in one part of the world, and now we can see how the world is predominantly small. But now to deal with things that are transnational in nature, we need these concerted efforts. We need these organizations to come together, pull these resources, and come up with a common agenda for all. Um, and we're seeing that playing predominantly an important role in international relations. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Kempa, you mentioned it first, and uh, Dr. Morumbasi has mentioned it like four times in the last uh, answer he gave, and I think Dr. Mwenja has mentioned it once. But I want to get down to the bottom of, um, ooh, we lost, we lost Dr. Kempa. Okay, okay, then I'll throw this question. Sorry, Martin, yes? Okay, so you come back. I'm sure. Okay, fine, no problem. So, because uh, I'm sure Dr. Morumbasi needs to, to measure some mate because of... Uh, the, the, the long answer you gave just now. So I'm going to ask Dr. Mwensha to answer this question. What are some of the causes of war? The, okay. Uh, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me give Dr. Kemba the chance. Like let me give Dr. Kemba the, the chance to answer that question now that she's back. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Kemba, we were, okay. I, was refer, I was referring to, yeah, what... Uh, Dr. Murumbasi and Dr. Wancharashi mentioned before, and you're actually the first one who brought up the word war. But what are some of the causes of war? Okay, um, I usually look at war from three angles um, based on what the scholars of international relations actually identified as causes of war um, after the First World War and Second World War and thereafter. So we've got three, three types of um, causes of war. The first is man. Or humanity. It is said that man or humanity has got that natural aggressive tendency to engage in competition. And with all this competition, given either the president or the leader, countries may go to war, nations may go to war. Um, the second um, cause of war is basically the state. It is said that the state must always remain succinct, such that um, you know the nation, that, that, those are the people that are part and parcel of a state will go to war for that particular state. At any given time, they'll get arms and you know run around and ensure that their state is actually maintained as it is. Then the third um, you know, argument as to why we have causes of war is the international system. I think um, my colleague Zalia talked about the fact that at times we may not have international institutions. And the fact that you do not have international institutions means that you've got anarchy meaning that any country can come in and um, you know, be bullied or it can bully other nations and eventually that will go to war. So um, based on that, um, those are again the three levels of analysis that we have in international relations. As we think about what happens around the world, we have to think about man or humanity as a source of war, because like I've said, man is um, and going to engage in war. Although realists and liberalists have differed on that. Liberalists say that man is good, man is um, you know, um, created in the image of God, and therefore we can never go to war. Of course, there's that you know, discussion. Then, of course, the state is a state. It must be protected, when, whether we like it or not, and that can be a source of war. Then, of course, the fact that the international system creates that environment of anarchy, where any state can go to war without having you know, mechanisms that have already been set in place, like having either the League of Nations that failed or having the United Nations currently to give states to go through a step-by-step -step process before they eventually go to war and how to even intervene in um, cases where you've got war. So I think there are those three you know, causes of war that we mention often in international relations. Okay, okay, I'm gonna ask now, just shift gears a bit. I'm gonna ask 
three very quick questions in terms of certain impacts on uh, on international relations. So I'm going to start with Dr. Mencha. Uh, what is the impact of race on international relations? Um, yes. Uh, these are, these are very, um, uh, if you look at it from the theory perspective of, of, uh, of international relations, then you can see race um, as a very controversial issue uh, because um, there's been, or there is a perception that, or rather the reality is that international relations as a field is a, is a Western, uh, what you call, um, it's a West, it's a Western creation. So it, when, when international relations was actually formed by Western uh, theorists and scholars, and therefore where for us who are in what we call the global south, when we look at uh, say the structure or the way um, the international um, or uh, the global relations are structured, you can see that um, we are uh, in what we call the marginalized south. So race obviously look, looking at it from um, as, as blacks or as Africans or as those of us who are in the global south as I've mentioned uh, there's obviously inequality and uh, this has to do with um, like I said the history of, of, of the not just the field from an academic perspective but just of the international power relations so the western countries the European countries are, at, uh, are in what we call our um, epicenter, and those of us who are in Africa and uh, maybe South America and some countries in Asia are at the periphery of this relationship. So there is some um, uh, sort of like imbalance in the power relationship uh, between certain countries. And Africa, of course, as a continent, not just specific countries, we are uh, sort of like... Um, at the lower level, whereas other countries are at, um, you know, at a higher level, despite the fact that maybe some African countries, uh, in terms of um, uh, development or economics, you could find some countries that have actually bigger economies that than some other countries. But then, because of this imbalance, uh, say if you are in Europe, then because you are closer to these European countries, then of course, definitely you you'll be closer to power than those of us who are in Africa. Um, other than that, I think the other issue with race, um, from what I've seen is uh, just from a, as a professional and as a practitioner is uh, when it comes to opportunities in international organizations, there, has, there have been complaints regarding, um, let's say, if you are African or if you are um, from countries that are in the third world, then uh, you would find that um, maybe a European or somebody from another, uh, from a Western country is more likely to get a job than you are. And this is because um, obviously they contribute more. They make, they give higher contribution to these organizations because that's how the international organizations such as the UN and the World Trade Organization survive, member subscription. So that also is an, uh, an aspect of race. And, and that's why some of these jobs, when you're applying for jobs internationally or some of these very high profile roles are always rotational so that to remove that aspect of bias. But as you are aware, if you look at the um, Security Council, um, there's no African nation in the Security Council. So Africans have been pushing for a seat at the Security Council, which has not yet materialized. And that just reflects how the imbalance in these race issues are still there in the international uh, arena. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mancha. Uh Dr. Morumbasi, I'd like to ask you, what's the impact of culture on international relations? You're muted. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Aweru, for that question. When we look at culture from uh, the aspect of international relations, there have been various ways in which it has been able to impact it. Uh, we have a famous um, scholar who uh, was talking about probably the clash of civilizations, what will happen when people meet. Uh, but now from a diplomatic point of view, we can see that uh, culture has actually been uh, picked up and become a central component of diplomacy, where now uh, states are seeking softer ways of uh, relating with people. And now that we have globalization going on, 
So we have now people-to-people -people diplomacy, cultural diplomacy uh, going on around the world. So we can see uh, this diversity has actually uh, brought in the aspect of uh, diplomacy. But on the other aspect, we can also see sometimes there's a clash between uh, different cultures uh, for one reason or another. Once they have met, uh, as Huntington had said, that probably when cultures meet, there might be a clash. Uh, but more specifically, when you're looking at, for example, the African perspective, we can see that it actually creates more opportunity uh, for moving to beyond, you know, this state-centric approach uh, in international relations, where we are seeing, you know, the predominant theories are talking about, you know, the state uh, and the, uh, how to protect the state, etc. But this is at the detriment of uh, sometimes peace. So when we have this kind of cultural diversity, the mixing up of the people, sometimes this now brings about um, more focus on the people-oriented focus, where you have cultural exchanges, you have exchange programs amongst people, and then you have people actually understanding things across different cultures. So one of the biggest assets you get from an international relations perspective is to be able to contextualize issues uh, based on culture. We have diverse issues, we have diverse interests, uh, but having all these coming together uh, makes it easier to contextualize it and actually use it as a strong tool of diplomacy. Dr. Kiamba, what's the impact of gender on international relations? Wow, interesting question. Um, we know that gender has been a big issue when it comes to the role of the various genders, whether it's man or woman, and their place in international relations. We see from the 1970s um, till currently, um, there has been a lot of movement um, and a lot of even the creation of certain theories to explain the role of gender in international relations. However, those theories tend to lean more on, you know, feminism and the role of women basically in international relations. The, the idea is because um, for a long period of time, it was assumed that when you talk about IR, everything that um, they talk about and everything that is discussed in IR is more about man. Of course, when I was talking about the causes of war, and I had to, of course, talk about man, but also include humanity, because war is not just about man, but humanity. And for a long period of time, of course, the ladies or women who are in IR began thinking that there's need for us to understand. So what is the role of ourselves, maybe, in international relations? And out of that, we get a series of you know, theoretical discussions called feminist ideas and feminist theories of international relations. Some of them have been quite um, radical in the sense that they want to uproot everything and change the role of men in international relations. Also, to give space, you know, to women in international relations, including to become presidents and so on. Then there's another um, side of gender in IR, and this is social feminism. The idea here is that women are better, you know, leaders naturally. And um, we are more in terms of the percentage in the international system. And out of all that, the women who are going to become leaders, hopefully, are the ones who will let, you know, the, the entire society also move forward, as opposed to men who some of the feminists say are really, really, um, you know, they do not think about the state, they do not think about the society, they are selfish in nature. So um, the role of gender basically has come at a time when we want to understand, so what is the role of women and how do we view, how do we view basically international relations? Because again, there's some scholars who say that men and women have got different ideas, different perceptions, and our brain is different, you know, when it comes to the way we analyze issues in the international system and in IR. So the impact has, such that, um, has been such that, of course, there's um, a different stream of theorists who regard you know, gender and its role in international relations and how important it is for people to study, you know, the role of women, the role of men, and also in the societies they are confined in. For instance, of course, when you come to developing countries, the role of gender is a bit more, maybe skewed or much more relatable because it is assumed that what happens to any man in Africa a woman is also feeling the same. If you have insecurity, it's not just about women having insecurity. You also have men having insecurity. And therefore, we have scholars, especially what was considered to be the third world. However, I like talking about the developing world, who came up with this idea that um, there's need to discuss you know, the functions of gender 
in IR and situate the various gender roles in IR and how we can better appreciate whether it is a man or woman or a woman taking up the entire society to help us understand IR. Maybe to give you an example for that. Um, currently, um, with all this um, COVID-19 going around, there has been a tabulation of countries where we've been able to see improvement in the numbers of people who've been able to move away from, of course, um, having a larger population getting COVID, infected by COVID-19. And indeed, it will say that, you know, when you talk about Germany with Angela Merkel, um, New Zealand, and basically where you have women in leadership role, that you'll find that there are less numbers of people who are dying or less numbers when it comes to the countries where you have women leaders. So, of course, we tend to appreciate um, gender in that aspect, that um, we want to see the roles of the gender and how it basically is part and parcel of the way we appreciate international relations. Thank you, Dr. Kemba. Now, I'm going to change our focus. I'm going to come back to what uh, Dr. Wenche had mentioned with regards to the AU, and then we'll make our way very quickly to the issues of COVID-19 and international relations. Um, just under a year ago, uh, Julius Malema, the Economic Freedom Fighters leader, had a few choice words when he was asked about whether the South African development community was pay playing the role it's supposed to play. Malema replied, SADC, there's no such thing. AU, there's no such thing. It's a group of old people who protect each other. They don't protect the interests of the people. It's a club. It's a gentleman's club. That's a quote from him. Now, Dr. Moencha, despite several efforts, why has the AU struggled to attain the kind of clout that other bodies such as the European Union has attained in Europe? Uh, thank you, Awedu. That's a very, um, uh, Malema is a very controversial person, and that's a very, uh, I would say, controversial statement. But let me attempt to address it by saying that, yes, um, compared to other regional um um you know multilateral organizations such as the um, uh, re regional uh, organizations such as the or continental ones such as the eu or um uh or global ones such as the un you find that uh, african union has uh, uh as you said um it has been ineffective uh, especially when it comes to addressing crisis uh, of, say, security nature, uh, such as now, um, if you look at what's happening right now in Mali, there's been a coup uh, where the government uh, has been replaced by the military. If you look at the um, uh, uh, war or um, the situation in Somali, these are uh, situations that the African Union has uh, either been has been unable uh, or struggled to you know to resolve or to bring under control. So having said that, um, you recall I I was when I was talking about the issue of race and international and and the, and, and the place of Africans or uh, uh, those of us in the global south in the international uh, uh, structure. Or from what you look at how um, uh, Africans, how very how Africans or African states contribute to international organizations, and I said some countries actually have more influence because they end up uh, contributing more. So if you extrapolate that argument into uh, in the context of the African Union, one of the reasons that people don't acknowledge, one of the reasons why the AU is not really effective is because of the limited resources that they have. Um, if you look at the budget that the AU has uh, against the scope of their mandate, then you will you will actually wonder how this organization is supposed to, you know, <laughs> address all these issues that it is faced with. And that's part of now the challenge. Um, we as Africans or we as, um, you know, as, as, as those of us in... Um, uh, in this region, even even if you look at the East African community right now, um, it has budgetary challenges because certain countries have not remitted their contribution. So this, I think, um, even when we are criticizing the, some of these organizations, we have to be cognizant of the fact that they survive on member contributions. And when these contributions are not made, uh, then they are not going to be effective. But then that doesn't mean that 
the AU does not have certain capacity challenges or gaps, or it doesn't mean that they are not, they, it, does, it hasn't made any uh, mistakes in the past. Uh, and this are, uh, can be, can be, there are so many that can be listed, but then you also, you, you, you are aware that, like I said, these organizations, they are voluntary and states sometimes can choose or not choose not to comply with certain um, uh, treaties or certain agreements. And therefore, this is how why international relations is so important. Because when you bring so many states, such as those of us in Africa, together to agree on one agenda, then it becomes a very difficult process of, uh, you know, uh, negotiating and agreeing and, you know, uh, uh, getting a common uh, position. And, that, and that's why, um, I, as much as we can criticize the African Union, I do think that... Um, what from what I've described, then you, you we, we need to be fair and we need to see how we can build the capacity of not just the African Union, but even the East African community and other regional uh, economic blocks such as the SADC, so that we can be able to have like a, a more coherent uh, regional coordination or regional mechanisms that work both at uh, intra-regional and at regional level such as um, AU. Yeah, I think we could do an entire show about the AU. We'll, we'll look into that at some other point. Uh, Dr. Murumbasi, what is the impact or importance rather and impact of international relations on an economy such as ours here in Kenya? Uh, impact of? Impact, uh, importance and impact of international relations on an economy such as ours here in Kenya. Excellent. Uh, so when, when we're looking at uh, the impact on the economy, uh, there are various things you look at. Uh, for example, now you're looking at the uh, importance of international trade. Uh, as my colleague had just mentioned, we have interdependence and we have scarcity of resources in the international system. Uh, states may predominantly not be able to be self-sufficient in themselves, and therefore uh, we need to see that kind of trade going on. Uh, but there's been an argument of where probably uh, how do developing countries uh, fare within the global capitalist international system. And probably now here I'll choose to look at it from an African perspective, uh, where we're looking at the impact, you know, trying to bring it back home. So uh, we have a lot of international trade going on, uh, because this is what actually moves uh, global economies going forward. Uh, and being in a global capitalist system, one of the important things that states need is capital. Uh, so uh, the, the, how effective you are in getting global capital, you know, capital in terms of profit, CTC, uh, will actually determine your economic success in the international system. Now, looking at Africa, one of the predominant problems has been uh, the low levels of intra-African trade. When you look at uh, how African states carry out their trade in relation to other parts of the world, we find that intra-African trade predominantly is about lower than 20%. It's about 16%, uh, which means that African states are actually trading more with other uh, actors in other continents. Uh, why has this been the case? Uh, many times we find that even the infrastructure to carry out this trade uh, within the African continent has not been there, has not been uh, very well established and has not been exploited fully. And that's why we're seeing the uh, low levels of trade within. The costs of carrying out trade within the continent has also been quite high due to various regions, uh, reasons. Uh, we have bureaucracies, uh, we have various domestic politics coming in, ETC. So one of the key problems uh, that African states face is actually the lack of intra-African trade. And that's why they recently signed it, uh, an intra-African continental free trade agreement was trying to correct that and make sure that intra-African trade actually goes up. Uh, because once you're able to achieve that uh, intra-African trade at a high level, then we will see a lot of um, uh, capital accumulation within the continent, uh, which will support even international organizations such as the AU. We are seeing uh, one of the main problems of the AU is funding. You know, it gets funding mostly from external actors, ETC. So one of the key uh, uh, areas of priority for African states in terms of international trade in economics is to try and see how to ensure that there is capital accumulation within the continent so that we can change the negotiation 
uh, the balance of negotiations in terms of international trade. If you look at the WTO, uh, African states need more leverage. So it's important to look at the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, which will actually be a game changer with regard to this. So there's a lot of optimism going there. Uh, and uh, when we look at other aspects, there's also another dimension where the politics might affect uh, the economic uh, functioning of the state. For example, if you have international sanctions, uh, that might have an implication on the domestic economy of any given state. When we have, uh, for example, foreign aid coming in, it might have an impact on some of the economic aspects of the given state. So there are various dimensions in which we can look at this and how it plays out. But the African Continental Free Trade Agreement would be something to look forward to uh, as a game changer, probably for the region. Fantastic. Uh, I want to bring all our guests now together on this particular question. I think it's very relevant considering that it's a medium upon which we are actually talking or using to try and communicate to our viewers. Uh, on January 16th, 1991, CNN anchor Bernard Shaw reported to the world the skies of Baghdad have been illuminated. As predicted, Iraqi power and communication systems were destroyed by the stealth fighter jets and cruise missiles. My question to all of you, and I'll start uh, with Dr. Kiampa, and then we'll go around Dr. Mencha and Dr. Dr. Mulubasi. What is the role of the media in international relations? Okay, thank you so much. Um, the media is quite important because um, when you talk about the role of the media and the public, there's an intersection. Indeed, we, we rarely get any information really from the state, um, but we get more information from the media when it comes to whether it's our international events or domestic events that we see, of course, every single day. So the media is quite important in first and foremost shaping the opinion of the public because it's not just you know giving us information, but at times like what we are doing today, you may bring in people who are able to shape the ideas of any situation or any particular event the other thing that um, the media is also able to do is to mediate. For instance, even before the 1991, um, going back to the 1970s and how the United States of America was able to use the media to mediate certain um, conflict or disputes that it had with um, Iran and, of course, other powers that were there at that point in time. So the media has got that ability to come in between um, nations that are in conflict and create an avenue for them to actually discuss issues on the table. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, the media is that important when it comes to ensuring that um, it is an actor that plays, you know, um, in trying to shape what is happening around and also to let parties come together to engage some of the issues around the table. The other um, thing that the media does quite well is um, it is able to articulate, for instance, foreign policy on behalf of the state. Many a times you've seen the media actually engaging the public in another country with regards to what is the diplomatic stance of my country towards you public, probably in Kenya, and uh, maybe we are talking about the USA, and how they are able to probably use programs like VOA or other such like things to articulate the policy of that particular country to shape their ideas. So we've seen a lot of that, including that um, the media has gone ahead to also create um, push for certain policies to be identified. Now that we are talking about being, you know, in the new normal, even before the new normal, the media was there to push, you know, certain issues um, that the government would come back and, you know, relook at those particular issues. And of course, you've given us a good example Indeed, when you talk about the Gulf War and other wars, like in Somalia, the media was there, it was present, and we were able to see, and out of that, we see the particular governments going ahead to actually put pressure on parties to either intervene in the conflict or, you know, in the dispute, or to manage the issue without, you know, letting the world be distracted when it comes to certain events. So the media is really important in that aspect. First, of course, for public diplomacy, but also, on the other hand, governments to actually use it to articulate their own policies without using too much fast, without using too much, um, you know, um, resources to get to the public on the other divide. Thank you, Dr. Yamba. Dr. Moicha? Yes. Um, I think, uh, as Dr. Yamba has so eloquently put, the media is uh, 
used as first of all as a as a channel as a, as a conduit for communication um by you know diplomats or states uh with uh their own public or with uh foreign publics so for instance um an example if you look at um uh, say uh, a station like china global uh uh television so this is a um, is a, is a, is, a, is a media house that is funded by the chinese and of all it's used to you know to 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 give a certain a chinese perspective to uh, to the global uh, uh, you know uh, community so if you look at say radio uh, uh, rfi which is french and so on and and others that i can also mention these are now like very good channels um some say propaganda but i would say they are there for uh, giving a perspective uh, that uh, maybe um a certain country feels that is not um uh maybe being given um, uh, highlighted or is not being prioritized so there's always um um opportunities uh, for states to or countries to shape opinion through media but then there's also what um with the with the advent of ICT and technology there is um, what we sometimes to refer to as media diplomacy or uh, uh, public diplomacy um, 2.0, whereby uh, now international relations meets um, ICT and particularly now uh, social media and um, uh, digital channels of communication. And this is now um, sort of like where now countries um, are you can say as other than just communication some of them have actually used it uh for propaganda so there is the element of statecraft where um, you can use the media to um sort of like i said give a certain perspective communicate with publics shape opinion but then they can be also where now you're using it to sort of like create a narrative which uh, sort of fits with what uh the agenda that you have to or, or the agenda that you want to pushed out there so the media can it does serve it it it, it serves a purpose but then uh, sometimes uh, we are seeing concerns because uh, especially now with the in the age of social media you are not able to be sure which media um, um, can be can be verified or can be relied on and which one which one can so yeah there's there's, there's the good use and then there's also the misuse of, of media especially in this digital age Dr. Morumbasi. Thank you very much. I think uh, the two scholars ahead of me have really articulated it, articulated this well. So I'll just mention a few more things just to back up that argument, uh, where we are seeing media coming in both as an influencer of perceptions and in that way probably indirectly also influencing foreign policy. And uh, another important aspect is probably where we are seeing now non-state actors, uh, you know, now, we, when we have non-state actors coming in, we're seeing the media has actually elevated their position uh, where they're able to exploit the media to shape perspectives also to gain leverage. We see this from various you know, criminal organizations, terrorist groups, ETC using the media uh, as a source of that. And when we look at it from the state perspective, we also see the media coming in as a strong uh, contributor to uh, information, you know, from information intelligence. So we see also sometimes the media is a source of information for state decision-making apparatus. And uh, the last point I want to bring about uh, in terms of the media is where we see sometimes media is also used to spread certain values, ideals. You know, each state has its own values. It has its own ideals. It has its own way of doing things. Sometimes it relies on its media apparatus to actually try and spread these ideals uh, to other actors internationally in order to uh, actually have an influence in that. So that was just to back up what has been said earlier. Thank you. So, Waweru, maybe yeah. if I can just, if I can just mention something. Um, there yes, was sir. a report, there was an interesting newspaper article uh, during, uh, just when the, uh, we had this COVID crisis whereby uh, uh, some, some, there was a criticism of China because uh, people say they have this what you call mask diplomacy whereby whenever they go to a certain country and they sort of like give a donation of masks 
there was always a media team there to sort of capture the you know the the images and then circulate them and this uh created like there was a big uh furor and uh, you know criticism and people said like china is using at uh, the, the donations as a pr stunt and it has been and, and it's using the media to sort of like show its uh you know uh its good side uh to the to the public uh because of the criticism that it had received uh, because of uh you know of course the virus and all the conspiracy theories so that's how sometimes the media can be sort of like used but then there's also cases of where people feel like if you take it too far then you can say this is this is misusing the media okay uh on that note thank you for that addition yeah that's a, a very key point um on the subject of covid that's where i want to try and bring it to a close now yeah um on july 16th 2020 Horn International Institute of Strategic Studies in partnership with the Institute of Diplomacy and International Studies hosted a virtual conference at the University of Nairobi themed Retreat to Nationalism in the 21st Century Globalization, Lessons for Africa from COVID-19. So my question to all of you is this, what has Africa learned from the effects of COVID-19 on development and international relations? Uh, I'll start with Dr. Kiamba. So what has Africa learned from the effects of COVID-19 on development and international relations? All right, uh, quite a number of things that we've observed um, when we came up with that um, idea to come up with a, you know, a discussion about what can Africa learn and what can the world learn from Africa in terms of how we are dealing with the situation. What we realized indeed was that um, you know, when you talk about international relations and you talk about major powers like the United States of America and other European powers, at this point in time now, they were reduced to just like any other nation that is facing certain, um, you know, crises. And therefore, what, what we get from it, as opposed to what we've learned in international relations that you've got hegemons and you've got powerful nations that can be able to manage their issues, we've seen definitely that... Um, Nations are not always capable to manage their issues, never mind how many resources they do have. So out of all this, one of the lessons that we learned is that um, we see more and more in Africa and around the world, we were supposed to, and we are supposed to take care of our home-based solutions. And that's what we've been doing, which the world had never envisioned that, you know, we can, we can as Africans be able to actually contain um, the COVID-19 as opposed to other nations that have got all resources but cannot contain um, that particular crisis. The second lesson that we learned from this um, is that when it comes to the healthcare system, indeed for our developing countries, the healthcare system has not really been improved a lot. But um, with the current situation then, African nations and other developing parts of the world have been forced to reckon with health security and how we can better manage you know, various crises that do occur because it has been said time and time again that some of these um, health issues usually come from Africa, you know, things like Ebola, malaria, and so on. And indeed, that lesson was a learning lesson for the rest of the world. And indeed, they say that, you know, Africa is already in terms with um, having a way forward when it comes to managing COVID-19 because the infrastructure was already there when we have to have issues like tuberculosis and other, you know, um, you know, diseases that we have. So I think one of the lessons we learned, at least, and we do appreciate as Africa, is that we're already up there. We've been leading when it comes to the management of COVID-19, as opposed to what we've seen other nations that we've always, you know, stood up to and, um, you know, say that we need to get more masks from this country and so on and so forth. So I think we are seeing Africa getting at least... Um, a place where we can appreciate the level of intensity of our own infrastructure and also our own plan when it comes to health facilitation and also the fact that um, we need to also secure our own nation. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moenche. Well, uh, three things um, uh, struck me when uh, during this period. First was the, uh, the, the vulnerability of economies and, um, you know, um, international trade to, you know, uh, pandemics or uh, uh, biological uh, threats such as COVID. Um, nobody uh, could have anticipated the level of impact that uh, COVID would have on, say, travel, trade, 
and um, um, including even other, um, you know, activities. Uh, so that, that was the first one. Uh, so even now, if you look at uh, um, how countries or uh, because of the, um, the, the restrictions in traveling, a lot of um, or other activities have now shifted, shifted online, including diplomacy. So digital diplomacy is something that has also uh, come to the fore. The second one uh, on the home front was the uh, sometimes uh, maybe uh, initially limited capacity to produce certain um, um, therapeutics and um, you know certain um, 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 equipment that we need to you know to to treat or to manage the disease such as uh, uh, say masks, uh, PPEs and so on and even sanitizers but which uh, have, uh, you know, uh, because of the uh, inability to save trade, then we've also we've built that capacity uh, pretty fast, as, as, as uh, Dr. Kiamba has mentioned. But also, thirdly, now from a regional perspective, the issue of uh, a weak regional coordination mechanisms. Uh, when you look at the crisis that we are having at our borders, the you know the 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 the, the, the uh, issues that we're having with the, uh, Tanzania uh, air travel restrictions between Kenya and Tanzania, the long lines at the border between Kenya and Tanzania and also Kenya and uh, Uganda, you can see that the um, the countries which are within the East African Community are not able to you know uh, they, we, we 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 cannot come together to sort out. Uh, how how to how movement of goods and people should happen within our region. So those are the three things that struck me, and hopefully we will be able to address them going forward through diplomacy. And last but not least, Dr. Morubasi. Thank you very much. Uh, when I pick it up from there, as Mwencha said, we we have dynamism in the international system. So what does this mean? One of the things that uh, we learn is that we should be able to act with speed in pandemics. Uh, we're seeing at the rate at which this pandemic came, uh, we needed really quick action, and I think African states did that to a certain level of success. Uh, the second point is that the importance of investing in healthcare systems, domestic states. Uh, we're seeing where now states, when the borders are closed, you know, you have to rely on your own healthcare system. So we have to put our money there. Uh, the third point is where now we need to leverage on IT and ICT, which played a big role in predicting the pandemic and even has played a key role in coordinating the efforts. Uh, the fourth point now, as we're talking about leveraging using IT, is strengthening of global partnerships where we need to actually. Uh, work together in dealing with this. And last but not least, uh, the issue of risk communication. We see in this pandemic the issue of communicating the risk, where sometimes it has been called fake news, ETC has actually curtailed uh, efforts at, uh, dealing with it. So prioritizing of risk communication in the face of disasters and pandemics is another key takeaway that we get uh, from the COVID experience. Thank you so much, Dr. Murundasi. Um, I can see we are pretty much done with the time. We haven't seemed to keep it to one hour, but as you can see, the conversation could go on and on. I have not even asked half the questions I wanted to really ask. Uh, but mine is to say thank you very much to our guest today. We, we really hope a lot of our viewers are covering something out of that. I definitely picked up a lot from that conversation. Uh, Mato, do you have anything to add? Yes, yes, yes. Um, lovely conversation. <clears throat> And uh, three quotes when, um, just let me clear my throat. Yeah, oh my, oh my, that of what about. So um, there are three quotes which I, I have um, based on the topic today. The first one is from good old John F. Kennedy. Geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, Economics has made us partners, and necessity has made us allies. Those whom God has so joined together, let no man put us under. How does that sound? Awesome. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Next one. You said you have three. Excellent. Yes. When you talk of diplomacy, there's no way. When you talk of IR, you can't. You cannot not mention 
one Madame Madeleine Albright. I've always found her quotes somewhere in in uh, whatever I've read to do with the topic. A lot of people think international relations is like a game of chess. Remember that's how we introduced this show. But it's not a game of chess where people sit quietly thinking out their strategy, taking their time between moves. It's more like a game of billiards with a bunch of balls clustered together. Madame Madeleine Albright. And the last one, and the last one, surprisingly, yet another lady I really hold in high esteem. It isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. Elena Roosevelt. Eleanor. Okay, I, to, uh, I just thought of one which inspired me a long time ago. Um, I mean, I think they still use it. But I'm going to ask our guests to give us their single line or their, their, out, their takeout in terms of a parting shot, usually very quickly. Um, mine is to borrow from South African Airlines. The tagline was amazing. I think it got me thinking about international relations. Bringing the world to Africa, taking Africa to the world. Um, yeah, that for me was a nice way to have to try and sum up. At least my understanding of international relations. So yeah. we'll kick off with Dr. Kiamba. What's your quick parting shot? Wow, um, it's, a, it's been a great discussion. I thought we would have a lot of things to say, but unfortunately the time has come to an end. However, my part in short is that um, just like uh, Matua said, because he's got quite a number of um, you know, ideas, um, I often think about international relations as a discussion. And in any discussion, you've got to say what you think about what is happening in the international system. And beyond just saying it, you've got to believe in it so that, you know, it is indeed a living issue when you talk about international relations. And it's not just enough to just say and believe in it. You've got to act on it. And therefore, in IR, it's about seeing, it's about saying, and it is about acting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Janita. Uh, Dr. Peter Mwencha. Uh, thank you, Oweru. Uh, for me, I want to look at uh, my parting thought would be something that maybe um, we been to. A, I remember you had asked uh, uh, Dr. Kiamba to talk about the theories. And uh, what I want to, but uh, for me, the thing is, uh, I want to point out that one of the other theories that for me is really key to the current uh, discourse about um, international relations is what you call constructivism. And this is whereby you look at the world and you imagine it uh, in whatever way you want it to be. So the whole idea behind constructivist is the, the issue of ideas and how you want to shape the world. So uh, we, 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 unfortunately, a lot of us are still stuck in this idea of very traditional, uh, say, um, what you'd call uh, positions. Uh, but what the world needs now and what uh, international relations, the way international relations for it to progress and become more relevant would be to look at what new ideas, what new solutions and what new, um, uh, you know, uh, proposals can we, uh, uh, or initiatives can we come up with to make a better world as, uh, as uh, some of those quotes have mentioned and also to come up with, you know, a, a, a better cooperation and international um, uh, relations. So, so we, if we look at it from um, from that approach, which sort of like looks to shape a new perspective, then we will be uh, sort of like we we'll live a better world than the one that we found. So that's that's my take. Last but not least, again, uh, Kige Murumbas. Thank you, Aweru. Uh, mine will be three. Uh, the first one is just saying that the world is our playing field. It's more interconnected than we think. Uh, as we have seen, something that can start in one corner of the world can spread like wildfire. So uh, the world is our playing field and we should actually elevate our thinking. We can live local, but think global in terms of our action. Uh, in term, in uh, tied towards that, we need to actually develop our global skills. We need to network uh, beyond our own uh, boundaries, just as we are doing in the disciplines where we have, we are breaking down the disciplinary silos, we should be able to do that. Think outside or even without the box so that we don't limit ourselves to the domestic setting. Uh, the third one is in terms of uh, African Union and African togetherness. 
uh, where there's an importance for African states to come together, go beyond the state-centric thought, and actually try and ensure that capital accumulation happens in the continent. As a famous Swahili saying uh, goes, Guniam uh, Tuku, Akisimami Wima. If it's really empty, it can't stand well. So we need to ensure that the African basket is filled uh, so that Africa can stand strong in this uh, global international relations space. So uh, even as individuals, let's ensure that the world is our playing field and let's not limit ourselves to local politics. Thank you all so much, Dr. Doctor, and Dr. You know, usually we have something in between, but uh, thank you so much for our panelists. It's been a very eye opening uh, conversation, as I said. Uh, we need to continue this conversation, obviously, Martin. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for uh, accepting to be part of uh, our panel tonight. Uh, truly grateful. And we want to, we wish we could carry on this conversation because I, I think there's still a lot we have not uh, touched on. Um, especially, as you say, the, the world is becoming this um, um, <clears throat> little, it, the, the global village is becoming smaller, it's shrinking. Um, thank you very much. And to those viewing us, we say good night. Thank you for following us, keep uh, watching. Subscribe so you get a reminder each time we go live. And see you next week on for yet another interesting topic on Great Leadership Live. Good night. Good night. Thank good night. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.